we're not going to get what we want as a country unless we start keeping our commitments. And uh, it appears that we no longer have an interest in keeping our commitments. We do it sporadically. And a country that keeps its commitments sporadically is a country that does not keep its commitments in any serious way. When you engage in intermittent reinforcement of the bad guys, then they are going to be reinforced, which is what is happening globally speaking right now. And by the way, this is going to have ramifications for how the situation ends in Ukraine. Speaking of which, we should talk about how the situation is going to likely end in Ukraine. So the way the situation is likely to end in Ukraine right now is that the Ukrainians are likely to cave to many of the Russian demands in a way that NATO is not going to like. And you can't blame them. You can't blame them. So Vladimir Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, who's been hailed as a Churchillian hero, yesterday he spoke in front of the UK parliament via satellite, and he was talking about how he would never surrender to Russia. Here's what that sounded like. And I would like to remind you the words that the United Kingdom have already heard, and which are important again. We will not give up and we will not lose. We will fight till the end at sea, in the air. We will continue fighting for our land, whatever the cost. Okay, but at the same time, Vladimir Zelensky did an interview with ABC's David Muir in which he said he was now prepared to drop his demand to join NATO. And the reason that he is saying he's prepared to drop his demand to join NATO is because NATO hasn't done what they were supposed to do, namely protect from Russian predation. So here's Vladimir Zelensky basically leaving the overture to, to peace open here because the deal that's going to get done here, and this is the most likely outcome here because Russia does not want to continue to pour hundreds of thousands of troops into Ukraine, taking away from all of the other places on earth where it wishes to extend its military power. It doesn't want to take troops out from near the Kazakh border in order to shift them over to Ukraine, for example. And they also are not loving these sanctions. So they're looking for a way out. And Zelensky is looking for a way out. So my guess is that we are closer to a deal than people think we are. And the deal is not going to please a lot of the people in the West who've been cheerleading Ukraine under the impression that Ukraine's solution looks exactly like our solution, which is utter defeat of the Russians. The Russians leave. The battle goes on. Zelensky is making clear that he will return to a non-aligned status that is somewhat friendly to Russia, and he might have to take that deal. And the reason for that, again, is because the West didn't make commitments early enough, didn't make those commitments strong enough. So if you're a non-aligned country, you have to you have to walk that razor's edge. Here's Zelensky yesterday. I have cooled down regarding this question a long time ago. Um, there, after we understood that Russia is not that NATO is not prepared to accept Ukraine, the alliance is. Uh, afraid of controversial things and uh, confrontation with Russia. I never wanted to be a country which is begging something on its knees. And we are not going to, to be that country, and I don't want to be that president. Okay, so he's now saying that he might give up his demands to join NATO or his attempts to join the EU, which is one of the Russian demands to end this war. In the end, a negotiated peace probably looks like Russia slices off regions of the Donbass, slices off Crimea completely and ends up with a commitment in the Ukrainian constitution not to formally join NATO or the EU. Now, presumably, the Ukrainian government then starts buying as many weapons as humanly possible to deter a future invasion by the Russians. But why exactly would Zelensky trust NATO? Why, why would he trust the United States when, for example, the Pentagon yesterday nixed a plan to get MiGs to the Ukrainians? And that was yesterday. It's really amazing. It's an amazing, amazing thing. So yesterday, the Polish government said, they sort of announced it just publicly because they figured that they were getting nowhere with the Americans. The Polish government wants to see Russia defeated in Ukraine because the minute that Russia wins Ukraine, suddenly there's now a border with, with Poland again. And so this is something the Polish don't want. So the Polish are like, okay, we want to get the MiGs in, but we can't get the MiGs in directly. We don't have the ability to do that. So what we would like to do is use the Ramstein base in Germany in order to ship the MiGs in, and then you are going to reimburse us for the cost of the planes. You're going to bring us new planes. We'll take our old planes, we'll give them to Ukraine, we'll use Ramstein as sort of the thoroughfare, and then you get us new planes. And they announced this publicly because they want to make clear, they want to shame Joe Biden and the United States into going along with that deal. And the Pentagon nixed it. So if you're Ukraine, why would you trust the United States? They won't even ship you the MiGs when the MiGs aren't even coming from you, they're coming from Poland. According to Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby, quote, we are now in contact with the Polish government following the statement issued today. As we have said, the decision about whether to transfer Polish-owned planes to Ukraine is ultimately one for the Polish government. So you guys are on your own. You guys are on your own. Yes, we're the world leaders. We're not leading from behind. But also, you Poles, you're on your own in the same way the Ukrainians are on your own. 
We will continue consulting with our allies and partners about ongoing security assistance to Ukraine because, in fact, Poland's proposal shows just some of the complexities this issue presents. The prospect of fighter jets at the disposal of the government of the United States of America departing from a U.S. NATO base in Germany to fly into airspace that is contested with Russia over Ukraine raises serious concerns for the entire NATO, NATO alliance. It is simply not clear to us there is a substantive rationale for it. Well, no, there is, in fact, a substantive rationale for it. The substantive rationale is that Russia does not want to go to war with the United States any more than we want to go to war with them. And we're not talking about establishing a no-fly zone now. We're talking about flying in military assets into Ukraine, which is not the same thing as a no-fly zone where we would establish complete air superiority over Ukraine and down any Russian jet that got in our way. John Kirby says, We'll continue to consult with Poland and our other NATO allies about this issue and the difficult logistical challenges it presents. We do not believe Poland's proposal is a tenable one. So in other words, if Poland tried to fly planes into Ukraine direct, we would be like, eh, maybe. But if NATO tries to do it via Ramstein, that'd be, a, but here's the problem. NATO is a member, Poland is a member of NATO. So if Poland flew a plane into Ukraine and then the Russians shot down that Polish plane, that would probably be an Article 5 violation and require an intervention by NATO. So all the United States is basically saying is they're going to allow not only air superiority over, over Ukraine to Russia, which at least is understandable because you don't want open conflict. They're not even willing to ship planes into Ukraine, which is the one thing that allows Ukraine to stave off Russian air superiority in the country. So why exactly would Zelensky not look for some sort of capitulation here? Why wouldn't Zelensky try to cut some sort of deal? And so the West is going to be all hot and bothered if this happens. But the truth is that the West's interests and Ukraine's interests diverge here, mainly because the West wants something from Ukraine that Ukraine is not willing to give, namely an endless war in which millions of people are made into refugees. We already have over 2 million people who are refugees from this particular war. According to the Wall Street Journal, the number of people forced to escape Ukraine has passed a milestone of 2 million as the civilian toll of the Russia-Ukraine war mounted along with international efforts to press Putin to halt the Russian offensive. A Russian military convoy opened fire near a checkpoint in the besieged northeastern Ukrainian city of Sumy, interrupting evacuations in violation of a brokered ceasefire. In many cities, Russia continued to obstruct civilians fleeing violence by firing in their vicinity and fighting nearby established humanitarian corridors. As heavy fighting continued across the country on day 13 of this Russian invasion, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees said an additional 1 million people have been displaced inside Ukraine after fleeing their homes as well. Meanwhile, the United States intelligence, they're announcing that 4,000 Russian troops have died. Now, the United States is perfectly willing to continue supplying just enough material for the Ukrainians to continue killing Russian troops. And we are willing to undergo sacrifice on behalf of the Ukrainian people to the tune of a couple of extra bucks at the, at the pump and also a bunch of dead Ukrainians who are going to have to face down the threat of Russian tanks in their cities. So they, they seem perfectly happy with the fact that, that 4,000 Russian troops have been killed by the Ukrainians, but it may be that the Ukrainians get tired of this. And they're like, you know what? If we go back to something resembling status quo ante, with a commitment that we are not going to join the West. Maybe that's the best we can get out of this. After all, what did the West ever do for us other than shipping us insufficient weaponry to actually maintain the country? Here is, here is the, the head of U.S. intelligence talking about how many people have been killed, how many Russian troops have died, Lieutenant General Scott Barrier. Are you able to say in open session how many uh, Russian troops have been killed? With, with low confidence, uh, somewhere between two and 4,000. That number comes from some intelligence sources, but also open source uh, and how we pull that together. Okay, so we may be satisfied with that, but it seems unlikely that the Ukrainians are going to be satisfied with that because they have a lot of people who are dying too and two million people who have been displaced. Meanwhile, China is getting involved in Russia. They're helping out. And so if you are, if you are again, Ukraine and you look to the east and what you see is a Chinese-Russian alliance that seems to be growing stronger, not weaker, not in terms of global power, but in terms of the connections between the two countries, meaning that Russia can do this indefinitely. Aren't you going to attempt to cut some sort of deal? China, by the way, is gaining a lot from this because China is now buying up Russian assets on the cheap, knowing that eventually there's likely to be a deal and then those stocks are likely to rise again. And people are going to retain their dependency on Russian oil and natural gas because, again, the greens on the left are insistent that they not increase production or get production from the United States. According to the Business Standard, China is now considering buying or increasing stakes in Russian energy and commodities companies like Gazprom and aluminum producer United company Rusal International, according to people familiar with the matter. Beijing is in talks with its state-owned firms, including China National Petroleum, China Petrochemical, Aluminum Corporation of China, 
and China Min Metals Corporation on any opportunities for potential investment in Russian companies or assets, those people said. Any deal would be to bolster China's imports as it intensifies its focus on energy and food security, not as a show of support for Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but because now there are a bunch of assets that are available to China that weren't available to China before. So when you reshape the world order in ways that do not actually demonstrate long-term strength, you have a problem on your hands. And there are going to be other opportunities for China here as well. So as the West cuts off China economically, and as corporations pull out of Russia, that that Russia, China, Iran access is going to go is going to grow stronger and stronger, which again is not exactly the problem. The problem instead is that a lack of strength and fortitude on the other side, without America in position as global leader, is likely to embolden that access in uh, in a variety of ways that are really inimical to the interests of the United States. A bunch of American companies, by the way, are already pulling out of Russia. Ford Motor Company suspended its joint venture with Russia's Solar's OJCC and halted sales to the country, citing concerns over the invasion. Volkswagen has cut relations with the company. Toyota is suspending production in Russia. Boeing is suspending. Airbus is suspending. BP is suspending. Exxon is suspending. Visa, MasterCard, American Express, PayPal, all suspending operations in Russia. Coca-Cola and Pepsi have decided to halt sales of their brands. McDonald's is closing its 850 stores in Russia, which, by the way, demonstrates the stupidity of the Golden Arches theory of foreign policy promoted by Thomas Friedman, who once suggested that any countries with McDonald's wouldn't fight each other. So that lasts precisely as long as they don't fight each other and McDonald's doesn't pull out. It seems that, as they say, McDonald's has now established a no-fry zone in Russia. Starbucks is suspending operations at Russia locations as well. Again, the sort of pulling apart of the world order in the absence of American power is clear to see. AWS, by the way, is also preventing customers from Russia and Belarus from getting web space as well. So the polarization of the global economy, the polarization of the global system continues to pace. Again, all of that was driven by a simple fact. The Russians thought they could get away with anything. And the reason they thought they could get away with anything is because historically they had gotten away with pretty much anything. And supply lines are growing more attenuated as well. There are a bunch of ships that are now trapped by the Ukraine war, endangering sailors in global trade, according to the Wall Street Journal. The war in Ukraine has severely hobbled shipping in the Black Sea with broad consequences for international transport and global supply chains. Dozens of cargo ships are stranded at the Ukrainian port of Mykolaiv, shipping trackers said. An estimated 3,500 sailors have been stuck on some 200 ships at Ukrainian ports, according to the London-based shipping tracker Windward Limited. More ships are stranded around the globe than at any point since World War II, according to maritime historians. The result is a shutdown of the world's second largest grain exporting region. Ukraine accounts for 16% of global corn exports. Together with Russia, 30% of wheat exports. Global wheat prices have jumped more than 55% since the week before the invasion. It turns out that when the world order collapses because of reaction to American weakness, things get worse for pretty much everyone, which is why it seems imperative that the that the West stop showing weakness. And yet that is precisely what the Biden administration continues to show on the energy front by making overtures to Russia, Iran, Venezuela. It's pathetic, and that's going to have more... Lo- Doubling down on stupid is not a good strategy when it comes to foreign policy or anything else. The first rule of holes, as they say, is to stop digging. Joe Biden has that shovel, and he is digging a hole all the way to China. Who's got two thumbs and wants you to like and subscribe? 